Wow, what an amazing turnout. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. Now, as you've probably seen from all the screens, we're obviously here to talk to Moby about his new photography book called Destroyed, which he's released alongside his album of the same name, and I believe an iBook. Has that gone live tonight? I think so. Um, now, I had the privilege of, of meeting Moby two weeks ago um, to interview him for Wired, and um, he was over in the UK to record um, a video for one of his latest singles. And in that, since those two weeks have elapsed, I have spread my time between my office in Green Park and my home in London Bridge, punctuated only by a brief trip to Leighton Buzzards. Moby, on the other hand, has been to Freiburg, Istanbul, Barcelona, Biarritz, Bologna, Milan, St. Polten, Rome, Ibiza, Alicante, Madrid, Belgium, and he added just earlier today that he's also been to um, Oporto in Portugal and Zurich. Um, I might have missed something, but please welcome to the stage, Moby. Did I miss anything? Um, no, I think that was it. That was it. But the, actually, the last two weeks... So that was, I think, 15 countries in 14 days. Yeah. Which is actually not too bad. Um, and also, they're all in the same time zone. So, I mean, like, getting from Biarritz to Bologna is pretty easy. But it was the two or three weeks before that when we were in, like, um, Dubai and Lebanon and Moscow, those were like the really, the long, long trips yeah. where you're going from time zone to time zone. I'm not complaining, but uh, so the last two weeks has been sort of a walk in the park compared to the yeah. few weeks prior to that. Now, I thought what we'd do is ask you a few questions and then go through some of the, your favorite images from the book. And then there'll be some time at the end when people can ask their own questions. Um, so, first of all, you're obviously very well known for your music, but People might not know that you've been um, into photography for almost as long. Yeah, well, I started doing photography when I was 10 years old. Um, actually, roughly around the same time I started studying guitar. Uh, and the way I got into photography was my mother had a really cheap Instamatic camera. <laughs> and so we took terrible tourist pictures with that. And uh, my uncle, who was a photographer, saw my interest in using this crummy little Instamatic <laughs> camera. And he gave me uh, a Nikon F that he wasn't using anymore. And the Nikon F, it's an amazing camera. It was sort of like the standard photojournalist camera in the 60s and the 70s. All the classic iconic Vietnam War pictures were taken with the Nikon F. So to give such an like, amazing, sophisticated camera to an 11-year-old yeah. <laughs> was sort of unheard of. Um, and so I got my Nikon F, and I saved up money, and I bought film. And I shot two rolls of film, and I sent it out to be developed, and it came back, and it was all completely black, because I didn't understand about exposure. <laughs> you know, because when you're shooting with an Instamatic, like, it's sort of idiot-proof. You push the button, and a picture shows up. Whereas with the Nikon F, I had, it's all completely manual. So then I saved up money, and I bought a light meter, and then my uncle gave me some of his old developing equipment, and so I learned how to process film and print film. Um, and slowly over time sort of figured out what I was doing and learned about different film stocks and different paper stocks. So this, because part of my hesitation in releasing a photo book is that in the age of digital photography, everyone's a photographer. Um, so it seemed really dilettantish for me as a musician to call myself a photographer when anybody with a digital camera or an iPhone can take pretty good pictures. Um, but. I started showing my pictures to friends of mine who are artists in New York, and they were really encouraging and said, wow, you know, you've been doing photography for 35 years, and the pictures are actually pretty good. Maybe you should consider showing them to other people. Yeah. And how do you feel about joining the lofty ranks of other musicians turned photographers like Brian Adams? <clears throat> um, well, <laughs> actually, the strange thing is I did a photo shoot with Brian Adams. Did you? I was, it was a few years ago. I was doing a lot of promotional things, and I looked at my day sheet, you know, the promotional stuff I was doing that day, and it said photo shoot with Brian Adams, and I just thought, oh, that's funny. There's a photographer who has the same name as the Canadian rocker <laughs> who wrote Summer of 69. And then I show up for the photo shoot, and it's actually Brian Adams. And again, there's a long sort of ignoble tradition of 
musicians trying their hand at other disciplines, mm. and it doesn't usually work out very well. But Brian Adams, to his credit, like he's a really serious photographer, and he like when he was taking my portrait, he really knew what he was doing. Yeah. Like he un he understood the camera, he understood the lighting, and uh, he wasn't just you know a dilettante with a digital camera. Yeah. So why now? Why? Do, I mean, you've been taking photos all your life. Why did you come out with a? Why have you decided to come out with a book now? Well, I'll, I'll never complain about touring, but I don't like touring. Um, I mean, it's it's. I get to stand on stage and play music and travel, and it's great. But for some reason, I just don't enjoy it that much. So when I tour, I give myself little projects. And the project on the last tour was to write music on tour and also to use uh, a camera to document this sort of strange and accidentally beautiful things that I experience when I'm touring. So I gave myself this project, and when the tour was done, I sat back and listened to the music and looked at the pictures, and the music went on to become the album yeah. destroyed, and then the pictures went on to become the photographs. And part of the idea behind releasing a book of photographs, on one hand, it's to share the things that I see on tour that I think are either really deeply strange or at times very accidentally beautiful, but also to try and put these photographs out in the world so maybe other people can help me to make sense of this strange way that I live, mm. you know. Um, and what I've noticed with that is there's a big divide between north and south. Um, when I've done interviews in Mediterranean countries, yeah. the journalists all comment on how lonely the pictures are. <laughs> And when I've done interviews with more sort of like Nordic, Scandinavian <laughs> countries, the journalists all think that they're very comforting. Okay. So it's, I guess, that different relationship to isolation. You know, isolation up north is comforting. Isolation in Italy is very threatening. Yeah. Now, in the past, you've talked about this idea of, of repurposing um, insomnia, because you're obviously um, a notorious in insomniac. And I wanted you to, um, to explain this. And d how, to what extent was the book and the album uh, a product of your insomnia? Well, I've had insomnia since I was about four years old. Um, there's, uh, what is it, that's a quote from Annie Hall, and I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> when Woody Allen is talking about life, and he says life is either bad or terrible, yeah. um, and I disagree with that, <laughs> but I can sort of use that to describe the way that I sleep. Like, I either sleep badly, or I sleep terribly. Um, like a good, so a good night's sleep, it's a bad night's sleep. When I've yeah. Five hours sleep, that's a good night's sleep. Anything less than three or four hours sleep is a really, truly bad night's sleep. And that's how it's been for the last 41 years. Yeah. Um, and for most of my life, the insomnia has kind of driven me crazy. But as of late, what I've tried to do is just sort of accept the fact that unlike normal people, I don't sleep very well. And if I'm going to be awake at 4 o'clock in the morning in a hotel in Stuttgart on a Tuesday night, staring out at this empty <laughs> sleeping city, I might as well do something with my time rather than just like lament the fact that I can't sleep like a normal person. And can you explain a little bit about the, the title, Destroyed, of both well, the book and the album? So the title comes from that photograph. Uh, I was on tour and I had a flight from New York to Montreal. And I love Canada. Canada is one of my favorite countries on the planet. I'm not such a big fan of their airline. Um, Air Canada, their flights, especially from LaGuardia, they're always delayed. So I had three hours in this dump of an airport, wandering around, and I somehow ended up in this long corridor that I don't know is necessarily designed for the public, yeah. but I ended up walking through this corridor, and no one ever walks down this corridor. And I thought it was so strange that they had a a security sign, you know, in this post 9-11 American yeah. obsession with security, they have security warnings everywhere, even in hallways that are not occupied by people. So they had this sign, and the sign said, unattended luggage will be destroyed. But I guess this was the cheap sign, so it only fit one word at a time. Yeah. Um, so it said, unattended, then a pause, luggage, pause, will be, pause, destroyed. And I just loved the way the word destroyed looked against this long corridor. So I took the picture, and I thought it made a really nice cover for the album and the book. Now, if we maybe take a look at some of your photos. I mean, first of all, how did you choose the ones that went into the, into the book? I know that you take, you're constantly documenting your life through your blog um, via photos and videos. And so how did you pick the ones that went in? Well, on one hand, I wanted to pick the ones that I thought were visually interesting. 
Um, but I also wanted the book to be a reflection of my experience on tour because there's so many books and articles and series of photographs documenting the exciting, glamorous side of touring. You know, pictures of Led Zeppelin in their <laughs> private plane, pictures of Kurt Cobain throwing himself into a drum set, pictures of rock stars jumping into crowds or having crazy parties with groupies. This is, my experience on tour is one of a lot of emptiness. Even though these spaces look familiar, there's nothing familiar, there's nothing truly familiar about them. You know, when I'm at home, my bed is a bed that I've chosen. Um, my towels are towels that I've chosen. My kitchen is filled with food that I've chosen. And then you go on tour, and every space you're in, someone else has made decisions about what your environment is. And after a while, it sort of, it drives you a little crazy. Um, now, if we, I don't know if we can flick through a few of your photos, but um, sure. the book seems to fluctuate between crowds of, rapturous crowds of ravers facing you as you're performing on stage, and then the really mundane kind of stark corridors, airports, yeah. um, hotel rooms. How do you, what makes you decide to get your camera out and, and take a picture? Because there doesn't seem to be that much in between. Uh, well, especially on this tour, I just took pictures of everything. So I sort of documented um, everything I encountered. And then when the tour was done, I went back and looked at the few thousand pictures I'd taken and found the ones that I liked the most, but that also, for me, represented the strange contrast between, you know, like this picture uh, is of Chicago at night, you know, taken from a hotel room. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. Everyone's <laughs> asleep except for me. And... I think it's incredibly beautiful because it's a city that's perfectly lit up for no one. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, just think of, I mean, on one hand, environmentally, it's incredibly irresponsible. Just think of the amount of power that's spent to keep cities illuminated when everyone's asleep. Um, you know, it's kind of like if you were to go home to your apartment and turn on all the lights <laughs> and then go to sleep and leave the lights on. Yeah. But it makes, it's, it's kind of beautiful in its stillness. Um, so yeah, so I documented everything and then went through and figured out which pictures I thought were the most visually compelling but that also best sort of reinforced this, the idea behind the book. Um, do you have any favorite pictures or is it a bit like picking between your children? Um, I do. Uh, <laughs> I like the, the, I'm sort of going through them quickly because one of my, f like for example, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, and one thing I accepted a long time ago is with the music that I make, my favorite songs that I've made are never anyone else's <laughs> favorite songs. Like I, I did an interview with Rolling Stone recently about the album Play and I was sort of looking at Play 10 years later. And it was, the irony there is that Rolling Stone didn't review the album when it first came out. <laughs> Um, but that's okay. <laughs> but so we were talking about doing like track by track and I realized my favorite songs on the album play, it's the second half of the record when the music gets stranger and quieter. Um, and so it's the same thing with the photographs. Like I like the really empty, sparse, like a picture like this, which only one, two, this only has really four compositional elements to it. Um, but I think that there's a, a, quite a lot of comfort in the emptiness in the picture. Do you have any kind of ones that got away, you know, photo moments in time that you thought this would make an amazing photo, but you didn't have your camera to hand? Well, yes, lots and lots of times. But what, what also happened is um, f when I first got a digital camera, I took tons and tons of thousands of pictures and I kept them all in iPhoto. I think it was iPhoto. So I kept, I backed them up somewhere and then I saved them all but I didn't. It turns out I was saving, I didn't know what I was doing, so I saved aliases for about 5,000 pictures, and I thought that that meant that I'd saved the pictures. And I was kind of amazed that 5,000 pictures backed up in 30 seconds. <laughs> and then I deleted all the original pictures and tried to open the aliases, and then it just meant that I lost about 5,000 pictures. Ouch. Yep. Did you, did you grieve? It was such an <laughs> egregious loss yeah. that I was like... It's gone. You know, I think I grieved for about an eighth of a second and then just realized, you know, it's gone now. It's, I guess I have to go out and take some more pictures. 
Now, something I haven't asked yet is what camera do you use to take all these marvelous photos? Well, I wanted, for, for the more, I guess, formal or serious pictures, um, I used the Canon 5D Mark II, which is, you know, sort of like, I guess the industry standard for mm. SLR digital cameras. But for most of the pictures in the book, I wanted them to be quicker and more spontaneous. And the 5D Mark II is quite a big camera, so it's hard to be spontaneous. So I think I just used a Canon Power Shot. So they're, the resolution, they're not like high resolution photographs. If you tried to blow them up too big, they'd sort of fall apart. Mm. But uh, I thought that to get a sort of more spontaneous snapshot quality to the pictures, I would use the power shot. And how much time do you take in their composition? I mean, are they snaps, or th do you kind of consider every image you take? Sometimes they're very considered. Um, sometimes, I mean, like some of the crowd pictures, like that is just a quick, spontaneous picture. I'm on stage, there's 50,000 people, and I take their picture. Um, and then others, like this next one, is actually quite a bit more formal. Yeah. Um, I wish that I'd had, a, I'd actually wish I'd had my better camera for this because a, a wider lens would have been, a longer lens would have been a lot better. Um, what's really interesting about this picture is it's a color picture. Even though it looks black and white, yeah. it was this, the beginning of a snowstorm in New York City and uh, the low cloud cover and the snow made the city look like a black and white photograph. Oh. But it's a color picture. And, um, and then like, that one is about as quick and spontaneous as you can get. Yeah. But I guess also because I've been taking photographs for 35 years, for better or worse, my brain is trained to see things in a compositional way. Not doesn't make it better or worse, but yeah. um, 35 years of looking through a lens. And so now I, I look at things compositionally, which... As I said, it doesn't make me a good photographer. <laughs> it just means 35 years of looking through a lens does change the way you see things. And do you do much kind of post-production on any of your images? And if so, what tools do you use? On these, I intentionally didn't. Like almost everything in the book, I think there might have been like, maybe change the contrast just a little bit. Yeah. But there's almost, there's very little cropping, um, very little post. I, The pictures I'm taking now, I'm shooting on the 5D Mark II and I use Lightroom. And so I'm actually processing them a little more seriously. Yeah. But again, with this book, I wanted, it's a, it's a document. Yeah. And so to have a document be relatively honest, I didn't want to alter anything too much. So there's, as I said, no cropping. I haven't really el eliminated all that much. Yeah. So as far as using the images as background, uh, all the years I've been touring, I've always focused on the performance and the presentation of the music, and I've worked with a great lighting person, so I don't know anything about visuals, yeah. <laughs> like projecting stuff on stage. It's just a world I don't really know much about. So, I, and, and some of these pictures, maybe they're a little too, there's too much information, because I think sometimes when I go to concerts, the, the visuals that look the best behind the band are the ones that are a little more abstract and graphic. Mm. And mo none of these are terribly abstract. Um, and who or what would you most like to photograph? Well, I mean, people have been taking pictures now for about 140, 150 years. And, you know, it's the first photo class I ever took. Um, the woman who taught it, she was a very old photojournalist. And... She asked the class a question, and everybody in the class got the answer wrong, which was, and the question was, what's the difference between photography in the 19th century and photography now? And, I, didn't no, exist. and the answer, the, well, no, it, it, it photography was invented in, I think, about 1850, but it's photography in the late 19th century, early 20th century, the difference between now is it was better then. They actually were, because they shot on big plates. Maybe the lenses weren't as good, but there's actually more information in an Edward Steichen photograph from 1905 than in almost any picture taken today. So photography is one of the few art forms that as time has passed, from a very technical perspective, it's gotten worse and worse. You know, like early archival, when they're, you know, they're, they're shooting onto like 12 by 12, 14 by 14, huge, you know, big plates. Yeah. So. That's uh, 
so so you're so I was talking <laughs> about the history of photography and your your question about what would I want to shoot. Yeah. And what I was going to say is in the last so the last 150 140 years of photography everything has been photographed. And a, a lot of things have been photographed sort of ad nauseum. You know, there's so many pictures of people and there's so many pictures of puppies and babies and flowers <laughs> and etc and a lot of those pictures are really charming and they're endearing and they're compelling but my I, what interests me as a photographer is trying to take pictures of the things that most people would ignore you know like the picture that we're looking at now it's uh, in the commercial train that goes under the English channel and so my question is what do I have access to that other people might not have access to and what do I see that a lot of other people would ignore? And those are the things I like taking photographs of. You know, the sort of, especially in this book, like it's the interstitial spaces, the spaces that people travel through. Um, come on, come on. <laughs> Not that one. Like, okay, like that. It's a picture of an empty airport. And I don't think anyone would ever want to take a picture of this, but I think that there's what it says about us as a species, what it says about our culture um, is fascinating to me. And also, there's just like an almost Edward Hopper-esque calm, sad beauty to it yeah. that makes me want to take pictures of it. So that's my, as a photographer, I just want to find the things that have been ignored and take pictures of them. I think there are a few photos in there where you're actually taking pictures and all you've got facing you is a, is a wall of people who are taking photos of you. Do you find that a kind of strange situation to find yourself in? Uh, sort of. I mean, I think as time has passed, I've gotten more, especially now because everybody has a camera. Mm. Um, probably quite a few in here at the yeah, moment. <laughs> and it used to be the case that like for some, in, in the days of film, for someone to take a photograph, it was quite an investment. You know, because film wasn't that cheap. Mm. And so to give up one image on a roll of 36 images was, it was an investment. So people only took pictures of things they really cared about. And now, be, you know, taking a picture doesn't cost anything. So people take pictures of everything. So, I mean, as a sort of quasi-public figure, I'm sure a lot of people take my picture if they don't even like me. <laughs> and they're just like, well, it doesn't cost anything, and he's there. They send it to Heat magazine. Yeah. And... And I have to say, one of this is one of my one of my pet peeves <laughs> is so. For example, I'll be out and someone want to take a picture, and that's fine. But then they'll spend two minutes figuring out how to take the picture, <laughs> and so you stand there with your arm around their spouse <laughs> while they hold up their phone. They're like, "Hold on, <laughs> wait." And it just it gets more and more spontaneous the more time passes. <laughs> so the grin slowly yeah, falls like, from the face. Okay, and they've got their phone. They're like, oh, wait, no, it's not Sudoku. How do I... Uh, hold up. It, oh. I mean, I figure I've probably given up a week of my life waiting for people to figure out how to take pictures with their phone. <laughs> so this is my... This is, and, and this might be an entitled, irritating request. I love taking pictures with people, could you figure out how to take the picture <laughs> before you ask to take the picture? Well, maybe just as you repurpose your insomnia, you can repurpose that, that time between oh, when someone asks you to take a photo and they do take the photo. I can spend that time thinking about all the people I resent. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Um, now, in 2009, you released your album Wait For Me with, with 16 drawings that related to the track. And obviously now you've released Destroyed and um, you've accompanied it with um, a book of your photography. What's next? I mean, is it, are we going to see an interpretive dance or a kind of fashion range? Um, I hope neither. <laughs> uh, I mean, do you think it's important to, for, for artists to, to create across multiple media? Well, I mean, the reason I do all, the reason I'm such a dilettante is because I enjoy it. You know, I love drawing pictures. I love taking pictures. I like writing essays. Um, I like making little movies. Um, I mean, my whole life is based around making music, you know, so that's what I do formally and seriously. Mm. All the other things I do because I enjoy them. And the more I, if I draw pictures, if I take photographs, if I make little movies, if I do these things, it increases the chances that something good might come out of it. <laughs> so, I mean, if I, if I take a thousand pictures, there's no guarantee that one of them will be good. If I don't take a thousand pictures, there's an absolute guarantee that none of them will be good. So that's why I just keep working in the hope that maybe something good will come out of it.
Excellent. Now, I think we've got some time for some questions from the audience, if anyone has any burning questions for Moby. There's one over there. I don't know if we can get and one over there. Thank you very much uh, for your work, for sharing your work with us. Uh, one question. You obviously name your songs. Do you have names for your photographs? Well, in the book, um, the photographs are all named for the place where the photograph was taken. But in some ways, it's almost an arbitrary naming or an arbitrary association because like this picture that we're looking at now, it could have been taken anywhere. So there's not much about the photographs that's site specific, but I still gave them a name of the site. You know, like this picture, I think it's called Iowa. And that could be Iowa, it could be Belarus, it could be New Zealand. Um, and I sort of, by, by giving them these names, I sort of wanted to reinforce this idea that when I go on tour, everything kind of looks the same. Which is not to malign the places I visit, because clearly Venice, Italy looks an awful lot different than Venice, California. And Berlin looks a lot different than Patagonia. But when you're on tour, you go to the airport, then you go to a hotel, then you go to the venue, and it doesn't really matter where you are, all these environments kind of look the same. So, so they have names, but the names are relatively arbitrary. Thank you very much for your kindness. Uh, there are a few more questions. There's one over there and one here. Oh, a few. Hi. Um, I went last night to the iTunes Festival performance at the Roundhouse, and it was an, an amazing night, and you talked a little bit about how Silver Apples had been there kind of at the birth of Electronica and uh, about some of the songs that you'd loved from your childhood. I wondered if there was any photographers who'd been a particular influence or someone whose work that you really do admire and you know, yeah. look out for. Well, the biggest inspiration for me as a photographer is Edward Steichen. And he's sort of like the grandfather of photography. And one of the reasons that he's such a big inspiration for me is when I was growing up, my mother had one art book and it was an Edward Steichen book. And so I, I spent hours and weeks and months just going through this book because it was the only art book that we had. And uh, I think, I'm not saying that my photography is anyway like Edward Steichen's, but it, also my mother was a painter, my uncle was a photographer, my other uncle was a sculptor. So I think from an early age, I just started, I became accustomed at, to looking at things um, from a compositional perspective. But Edward Steichen, and then, uh, a huge inspiration for me was Wolfgang Tillmans because when I was a lot younger, a huge part of photography was the craft. You know, like how, like your, your understanding of different film and your understanding of different print, of different paper. And then Wolfgang Tillmans and some of the, let's call them like the, the ID and face photographers of the late 80s, they came along and said that like craft is fantastic but some of the most compelling images are actually shot accidentally without any understanding of craft. And so they kind of, for me, gave photographers a license to shoot quickly and spontaneously without focus on craft to potentially create really compelling images. Um, and then more recently, uh, Richard Billingham, he put out, I think, one of the best photo books ever. It's called Raise a Laugh. And Sally Mann is probably the best photographer of the last 50 years. Um, my friend Jessica Dimmick has an amazing photo book called The Ninth Floor. So lots and lots of people I find incredibly inspiring. That's great. Thank you. And thank you for last night as well. Oh, Excellent. Thanks. I think there was a question a bit further along as well. Uh, hi, Moby. If you had to choose between photography and music, which would you choose? Oh, I would choose music. I mean, I love photography and I, I love the history of photography and I love looking at photography and I love talking about photography, but my... My life's work is working on music. So, I mean, if someone held a gun to my head and said, you have to choose photography or music, I would choose music. It would be, it would be sad because I love visual arts, but um, music, I, I, a long time ago, I realized that's what my life is dedicated to, is just trying to make music that I love. What about tea, if you put that into the mix? Tea is awfully nice. <laughs> um, I think between tea, photography, and music, tea would be the first to go. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Um, do we have any more questions? Oh, yes, we've got one here. Hi. Just wanted to know, what, what's your favourite lens that you usually carry with you? 
Um, my favorite lens is a lens I don't have anymore. Um, and what was, oh, what was it? It was for a Bolex. And this is sort of driving me crazy. It was, an, it was made by Ingenue. Do you know the company? It's a French company. And it was this, this wide, vaguely fisheye lens, but it had the most beautiful distortion on the edge of it. And, but it was for a 16 millimeter uh, film camera. And I'm, I'm still sort of like on the hunt to try and find an SLR version of this. So that's, but I have to say like with the 5D Mark II using like a really short lens and being able to shoot in such low light is amazing to me. Cause when I was growing up, like, I mean, I'm, cause I'm old. I remember when they introduced 3200 ASA film because before that, the highest ASA, I believe it had been 1,000. And they introduced 3200 film, speed film, and all of a sudden you could shoot in much lower light. But nothing compared to what you can do with like a really short lens with the 5D Mark II. I mean, it, it sees light that isn't really there. And it's, ama like, it's so amazing like, to shoot in a really dark environment with a really, really low f-stop and then put it into Lightroom, and suddenly there's information that I hadn't even been aware of. It's, it's, it's like magic. Thank you. Um, there's a question here, and I think there was one behind as well. Hi. I'm from Canada, and I was wondering what are some of your favorite places to shoot while in Canada? Well, the thing is, I mean, because Canada, and I'm not just, I mean, I said earlier I love Canada. Um, like I said, not so much the regional Air Canada flights, but Canada, it's such a perfect country, um, and there are parts of it that are so beautiful, especially out west. But the conventional stuff, whether it's like Lake Louise or the Rockies or BC, um, it's so beautiful that I feel like there are other photographers who are much better at capturing the beauty of that, you know, the big grand beauty of Canada. I'm probably more interested in taking pictures of a fluorescent lit doorway behind a Burger King. <laughs> so, like I said, because my, as a photographer, I really try, I like to document the things that other people would most likely ignore. You know, so my photography, it's sort of like the island of misfit toys. You know, it's like <laughs> the stuff that no one else is all that interested in. Um, and the gentleman behind, if you could just pass the mic over. You talked about your inspiration. The, um, the BBC did a documentary on the cameras that changed the world, like for filming. Um, what got me into photography was a war correspondent um, because he, in the end, um, Neil Davis um, f filmed his death. But is there any photographs that you think or cameras that will change the world? Like, that, um, that did change the world? Or will? Oh, will? Because, like, you know, like iconic photos of Kennedy, mm -hmm. um, Hendrix, that, you, like you said, people have just taken, but there's no... They haven't really changed anything. They haven't made a difference in someone's life. It's just that photo that they took at the moment. Um, I mean, it's hard to say because it, it's sometimes hard to judge a photograph... So much of it's context, you know, and so a photograph that's taken today that might seem really commonplace 10, 20, 50 years from now might seem really relevant and really iconic. So, I mean, like the person who was taking pictures of JFK right before he got shot, as he was taking pictures of JFK in the motorcade, thought he was just taking another picture of a president in a motorcade without understanding, you know, just how you know, horrifyingly iconic those pictures would end up being. So it's almost like not for us to judge how relevant or iconic an image is going to be. It, it sort of takes time and, and distance, I think. Uh, but I, I mean, but I do think it's amazing now that everything is documented, you know, whether it's with phones, cheap digital cameras, CCTV cameras. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's the most documented period in human history. And I'm wondering what future generations are going to take from that. And I think we've got one last question, and then we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry if my English is not so good, but uh, you, you said uh, that, you, that you love taking uh, take pictures of uh, things that, that people ignore. Uh, but do you think it's getting an influence of the music you make? Like, uh, per, for example, uh, ambient music you, you made? Uh, yeah, I mean, I read... Are you French? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, I read a quote um, years ago from, uh, from Eric Satie, 
and Eric Satie was talking about his music, and he basically said that he wanted his music to blend in with the sound of people eating dinner. So he sort of wanted his music to sometimes be ignored. Um, and I, that resonated with me. It also like Brian Eno, when he invented ambient music, he invented it to sort of be ignored background music. Um, and with, with some of the music I make, I mean, selfishly, presumptuously, I'd like people to pay attention to it. But I also like the idea of creating, on one hand, like ambient music that sits in the background. But I also really like the idea of making more sort of broken down, vulnerable albums that are not for the mainstream, but might have great meaning for the few people who actually listen to them. You know, like, I mean, the most recent album, Destroyed, it's certainly not a mainstream pop record, but my hope is that the few people who are willing to listen to it will actually get something out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for answering all these questions. Um, let's give a round of applause to Moby. Thank you.